So today's video is sponsored by Athletic Greens. I'll tell you more about them in just a bit. We love to glorify ancient conquerors. Countless history books are filled with conquests and deeds of men like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Modern day Western society is built on the values that these leaders and their armies spread. Stories, songs, and monuments commemorate their legends thousands of years after they lived. However, there was a man far more prolific, and if measured by the same standards used to proclaim the greatness of Alexander and Caesar, land conquered and people ruled, much more successful than any of these vaulted men in Greco-Roman history. A man who ruled over history's largest land empire that stretched from the Pacific Ocean to the Caspian Sea. The man who subjugated over 30 countries as defined by modern borders and killed so many people that he dropped the carbon levels in the atmosphere and is said to have fathered so many children during his lifetime that his DNA is present in tens of millions millions of descendants today. The man is Genghis Khan. He is history's greatest conqueror, but also its greatest mystery. Not much is known about his life, and even less about his death. The man who ruled over much of the Eurasian landmass is now lost to time. No one even knows where his grave is. Many explorers, historians, and treasure hunters have searched high and low for the great Khan's grave, but none have ended their quest successfully. But that won't stop us from going on our own quest, even if it's only from the comfort of our couches and desk chairs. Today, we're going to look at the hunt for Genghis Khan's tomb. Though not much is known about his life, Genghis Khan's legacy is full of the legends and stories that naturally accompany such an influential figure. These legends and stories mirror their subject's life. They are full of competing facts and warring narratives. The uncertainty starts right from his birth. Different sources place the Khan's birth at either 1155, 1162, or 1167. What is known is that he started life with the name Temujin. Stories of his early years are those of being shunned by his tribe, oppressed at the hands of his enemies, and barely scraping by in abject poverty. But there are also legends of Temujin's fierce passion and influence over people from a young age, stories of cunning and leadership that helped him out of these tough spots. He escaped captivity at the hands of an enemy tribe by convincing one of his guards to help him when his family's horses were stolen. He persuaded a young herder to abandon his animals and family and not only help him retrieve his stolen horses, but attach himself to the future Khan forever in service. So today's video is brought to you by Athletic Greens and I'm excited to share with you how I have been taking care of myself with Athletic Greens and it's been going on for a while now. Look, it can be a struggle to find the time and honestly the motivation to take care of our health but look i've incorporated ag1 from athletic greens into my wellness routine and it's been a bit of a game changer to be honest it replaces all of the health products that i used to take separately i used to take like a multivitamin pill i uh, used to take these probiotics immunity support all of that kind of stuff and uh, well athletic greens handle it all look over on the back here they've got this list of vitamins and minerals that are included and it's really long and it's in tiny print because there are so many it also tastes delicious Let let me just have a quick hit of it right now. I typically have it in the morning with my coffee and I feel like it does me good at that, that sort of time to get started with my day. It tastes sweet. It's kind of like pineapple and vanilla, which they told me what it was. I always just thought it kind of tasted sweet and good before, but now I know and I can't untaste it. So there you go. Plus it's super easy to make. All you do is you, uh, you saw the bag I had previously with the greens in it. What you do is you put them in this tub and then every morning, take a scoop out, put it in the thing, shake it up, and you're good to go. I love starting my day with AG1 because it makes me feel energized, it makes me feel focused, it makes me feel healthy. And look, I know investing in my gut health is an important thing to do. It's good for overall wellness. Plus, there's great news for you guys. If you go to athleticgreens.com forward slash megaprojects or click the link in the description below, you will get a one-year supply of immunity-supporting vitamin D3 as well as five travel packs for free with your next purchase. I have them over here so you get that for free again athleticgreens.com slash mega projects and now back to today's video when Temujin set out to get a stolen wife back from a tribe that had sworn a grudge against Temujin and his deceased father, Temujin won the help of the most powerful Mongol prince, leader of the Keri tribe, and gained a 20,000 man army to confront his wife's captors. Temujin's power only grew from there. His personality drew many loyal followers to his side, and his genius political strategy and battle tactics subdued the rest of his opponents. 
Before long, Temujin had only his one-time close friend, Jamuka, standing in the way of becoming the universal ruler of all Mongol peoples. At the suggestion of his wife, Temujin split ways with Jamuka. This is the moment in history when legends claim that heaven and earth deemed Temujin to become the ruler of the Mongols. In a saga of political intrigue, tribal step warfare, and imperial ambitions that makes Game of Thrones look like a children's book, Temujin eventually bested his friend, subjugated the remaining steppe tribes, and outmaneuvered the Jin Emperor in China to finally be named Genghis Khan in 1206 AD. For the next 20 years, Genghis Khan would oversee the expansive conquests of his army. His empire would spell the end of the Jin dynasty in China, despite many attempts by the Chinese to pay off the Mongol conqueror with tempting fortunes. His army would wipe the Khawarezmian Muslim Empire from the map after it slaughtered a band of Muslim traders traveling under the Khan's protection. By its end, Genghis Khan's explosion across Asia would bring much of China, Russia, and almost anywhere between the Pacific Ocean and the Caspian Sea under Mongol control. By his death in 1227, Genghis Khan had crafted for himself a fearsome, a respected, and enigmatic legacy. He was known as a religious man drawn to worship in times of crisis, but driven by a passion for revenge when crossed. He engaged in some of history's worst massacres, often lining up survivors of conquered towns in front of his caravan and beheading anyone who stood taller than the wheels on his wagons. He sowed terror and discord among his enemies with psychological warfare that stopped soldiers in their tracks before his army's horses. At the same time, he appreciated culture and philosophical discussion so much that the Khan's reputation encouraged Chan Chuan, one of the most well-known Taoist sages of the time, to travel the length of Asia to engage in debates and discussions with him. Genghis Khan ensured that his monumental feats would be only the beginning of the Mongol domination of Asia. Before he died, Genghis Khan chose his son, Ogadai, with great care and thought to be his successor, and ensured Ogadai's brothers would faithfully follow his rule. He left his son a thriving army and an empire ready to continue its conquest of the known world. Genghis Khan turned the step from a land of constantly warring tribes to a unified world power, made the Silk Road what we know it as today, a highway of its time between Asia and Europe that introduced the latter to innovations like gunpowder and printing, and took China from being an advanced state to a world power. Mongolian culture has taboos around discussing death. This means that the sources where experts get much of their information on the Great Khan discuss little of his demise. Where facts leave empty spaces, legends often tend to fill the void. Stories on the death of Genghis Khan range from those as reasonable as dying from wounds sustained in battle or falling off his horse to the fantastical notion of being killed by a vengeful queen or being struck by lightning. Genghis Khan, a man so powerful only lightning or a woman could stop him. What the sources do tell us is that before his death, Genghis Khan requested that his body be hidden and that no one should ever disturb his remains. That's about where the facts stop and give way to legend again. It's said that after his death, a thousand soldiers carried the Khan's body back to Mongolia, killing anyone who saw them along the way to keep their roots secret. To bury the body, the soldiers diverted a river, buried the corpse, allowed the river to flow over the burial site once more, and trampled the area with a thousand horses to cover up any evidence. And just to ensure there was no living tongue that could let slip the whereabouts, the soldiers then committed suicide. Other legends claim they buried the body in land frozen by permafrost so that no one could ever dig it up again. Still others attest that the coffin that carried his body was already empty by the time it arrived back in Mongolia. This last legend has gained some academic support over the years. According to historians, Genghis Khan died when he was waging war in northeast China, over 300 miles away from his homeland in Mongolia. Since that would have been a long trip back and then an arduous task to keep it a secret from anyone around, some historians claim that Genghis Khan was buried somewhere in northeast China and that the procession that supposedly carried his body back to Mongolia was just a decoy. However, other accounts, based on just as reliable sources and supported by just as many experts, claim that his body is definitely buried somewhere in Mongolia. Perhaps it is by the Altai Mountain, a burial site Marco Polo claimed in his writings was the invariable custom of all the Grand Khans. Or maybe it's by the Anon River, or maybe it's by the sacred mountain of Burke and Khaldun. Not even Genghis Khan's grandson and eventual successor, Kublai Khan, knew where his grandfather's body was buried. Amid the confusion, one thing remains certain to this day. No one has ever found Genghis Khan's tomb. No one knows where it is. The 
The lack of clues and the absence of any success has far from dissuaded searchers in their efforts. The mystery of it has attracted historians, anthropologists, explorers, and treasure hunters alike. Drawn by the wealth of legends, academic value, and treasure that is sure to be buried with him, these tomb hunters search tirelessly to unearth the founder of the modern Mongolian nation. However, since the Mongolian people hold Genghis Khan in such high regard as their founder and forefather, and since his last request was that his remains never be disturbed, many Mongolians oppose the efforts taken by those hunting for his tomb. But the common sentiment of an entire nation does not seem to phase the tomb hunters. Efforts to find Genghis Khan's tomb range from individual quests like those of American amateur archaeologist Maury Kravitz to well-funded, technologically driven expeditions like the National Geographic Valley of the Khans project, which used satellite imagery from space to survey the Mongolian landscape in search of the tomb. Even projects as big as the joint governmental Japanese-Mongolian expedition have cast their net across the Mongolian expanse. That was before it was halted after the peaceful democratic revolution against the communist government in the 90s, however. Such efforts have turned up tantalizing clues. In 2010, a research scientist enlisted the help of over 10,000 volunteers to scan satellite images of over 6,000 square kilometers of land to spot geographical oddities. The crowdsourced effort produced data that was fed into an AI that churned out 55 likely locations for the tomb. All the sites were thoroughly excavated, but Genghis Khan's body still evaded discovery. In 2015, a French expedition used drones to examine a suspicious-looking mound on the sacred mountain Burke and Khaldun. This project was undertaken without the approval of Mongolian authorities, so the examination was limited. However, the French duo was able to deduce that the mound was man-made and possibly a tomb based on those of Chinese imperial styles. The site has stirred a lot of speculation. It's often at the forefront of any discussion of the tomb's whereabouts. The Secret History of the Mongols, written in 1240, and the oldest surviving written work on the last days of Genghis Khan, claims that he often sought refuge at this mountain, carried out his religious worship there, and declared it the holiest of mountains in Mongolia. Most tantalizing, though, is a passage where the great Khan is quoted as saying, bury me here when I pass away. However, nothing more can be done at Burke and Khaldun until the Mongolian government allow researchers into the protected land. The search no matter how close it seems to get to the truth, remains frustratingly confusing and unsolvable because of a couple of reasons. The landscape of Mongolia provides the first, and perhaps the most insurmountable barrier. A country seven times the size of Great Britain, but with only 4% of its population and 2% of its roads, Mongolia is a dangerous trek at the best of times and simply impenetrable at the worst. Another aspect that makes discovery difficult is the likelihood that the tomb could be as much as 20 meters underground. Excavations of burial sites of tribes similar to the Mongols have exhibited such deep dug practices. These discoveries lead many tomb hunters to assume Genghis Khan's tomb could be as deep, if not deeper. After all, this is the great Khan we're talking about here. Anything you can dig, Genghis Khan's army can dig deeper. The hunt for Genghis Khan's tomb has proven a stubborn riddle and a one laced with an array of legends and myths. And as is inevitable in any unsuccessful human endeavor, people started looking for a reason for the failure. The legend of the curse of Genghis Khan's tomb boils down to one simple though outlandish belief. If the great Khan's tomb was ever to be opened, the world would end. According to Mongolian shamanism, when a person dies, their spirit leaves their body and their bones are invaded by evil forces. Bodies are usually buried right away since coming into contact with the remains could mean dangerous consequences for the toucher. Believers of this legend of the curse claim real-life historical happenings support it. In 1941, Soviet archaeologists discovered the tomb of Timur, a 14th century king and descendant of Genghis Khan. Ignoring the warnings of disturbing Mongolian remains, they unearthed the tomb and excavated Timur's remains. Not two days later, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. This turned out to be one of the bloodiest campaigns in an already brutal war. Soon after, Stalin ordered Timur's remains be reburied and not disturbed again. A different curse has been used by explorers to justify their hunt and the eventual, as they see it, unearthing of Genghis Khan's tomb. Since the Khan of all the Mongols was such a powerful conqueror, ruler of history's largest empire, and undoubtedly incomprehensibly rich, his tomb is destined to be full of unimaginable riches, golden jewels from his conquests, as oh well as a wealth of historical and archaeological knowledge. Given the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow waiting for them, searchers claim it's only a matter of time before they find the tomb. And with all of today's technology at their disposal, they say solving this historical mystery is inevitable. 
However, short of several tantalizing leads, explorers are no closer to finding the tomb than they were when the hunt first started. Genghis Khan became history's greatest conqueror by outsmarting and sowing fear in his enemies. These tactics are still serving him well long after his death.